Well, good morning, church family. You have to bear with me a moment. Uh, I was completely undone by that song. Having just come back from Israel and having walked in some of the very spots where our Lord and Savior did, uh, my goodness, it's uh, hard to even uh, put into words or to express. Uh, I wanted to start out with a few jokes, but I don't, I don't have them <laughs> at the moment. I was going to tell you the only people that are allowed to fall asleep this morning are those who went on the trip, okay? I was up at four, all right? I was still trying to get my clock rewound. Uh, I want to show you just a few, few uh, pictures. This is our group. Um, as Mark said, uh, there were 44 of us. Um, if you get a chance, and we have another trip coming up in February. Um, I didn't know what to expect, um, but I was, uh, I'm a huge proponent uh, uh, just because of the way that it makes the, the scripture come alive and, and you piece some things together. Um, I, I realize now how visual I am and, and just seeing some of those things, it, it just becomes magnificent. Um, for me, the most special moment, go to the next slide, the most special moment was, this is, this is Caiaphas' house. And these are the steps off in the distance that is the Mount of Olives. And so the night of his betrayal, there in the Garden of Gethsemane, they would have captured him and, and brought him up these very steps. And to your right, there is the courtyard where Peter was warming his hands by the fire while a sham of a trial was going on. And then inside Caiaphas' house, we were we were actually able to see the spot where, where Jesus stayed the rest of the night until the trial in the morning. And so for, for me, that, that lasting image, uh, again, I'm, I'm a short for words. Now, I, I did want to warn you, uh, we didn't always feel safe. That there was a very scary moment of the trip for me personally, and that was this right here. Connie McMillan got up, uh, by the way, she turns 80 in a couple days, I think, uh, got up on this camel. And it was the fear of the trip for me, okay? They're like, hold on tight. And I'm like, please don't fall. There she is. It was, it was an awesome, awesome trip. I will continue to unfold uh, some more details as we go on. I did have some exciting news. Uh, well, it may not be that exciting for you. That is that that I learned so much about the land that, that I think I'm able to paint the scripture in such more vivid pictures that I think we need to start back over in Acts chapter one. I know we've been there a year. All right, just kidding, you got the joke. All right, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We are in Ephesus, Paul is in Ephesus. As Chad walked us through last week, did an incredible job of highlighting, guys, a revival, right? The spirit of the Lord moved and fell in an incredible way. I, I'm gonna give you some more details, just to remind you about what Ephesus uh, was like as a city. It's a huge city, okay? 250,000 people, uh, but the Lord brought revival there. So listen, in Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse, uh, I'm going to read 18 through 20, just to kind of reset us for this morning. It said, many also of those who had believed kept coming and confessing and disclosing their practices, that is, their repenting. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found that it was 50,000 pieces of silver. Okay, that's a, that's a drachma, that's a day's wages, right? If, if you say we, we have a, a $100 a day that you might make, that's $5 million worth of sorcery books. And they burned them. And so the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, this morning we come to you and we do declare that you prevail. You prevail over the darkness. 
that surrounds our individual lives and our culture, that you are a God who reigns above it all, that you are sovereign, that you are in control, and that you rendered the heavens. You came down and you sent your son and you won our victory. So that this morning we are filled with hope and joy, rejoicing at Peyton's baptism, rejoicing at, at just being able to sing praises to you and, and to bask in your presence, God. You reign above it all. We worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Many of you have seen footage of the book Burnings in Nazi Germany. As the culture was swept up in ideals of hate and anger and oppression. This scene here in Acts chapter 19 is the exact opposite. It's joyful repentance, willful surrender, freedom from oppression, not filled with hate, but a newfound love that is greater, that is overpowering all the darkness that used to be there. And one by one, as thousands of believers comb through their homes, realizing that they were deeply oppressed by dark magic. You see, almost every home had a small book for calling upon the gods. What history will call the Ephesian letters. Now, don't get confused by that because we, we have a book in our Bible called the Letter to Ephesians from Paul. The Ephesian letters, what's known in history, is a set of well-known magical words. Like if I said abracadabra, okay? And these were books of magic that centralized in Ephesus. But here they were cleansing their lives because Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords because he reigns above it all. And in comparison to him, there is no other. Now, Chad did an awesome job last week of highlighting the revival that took place here in Ephesus, a movement that, was con that is considered one of the greatest of all time. Ephesus was the largest city in Asia Minor with more than 250,000 people and prominence in the Roman Empire. The magnificent temple of Artemis, one of the seven great wonders of the ancient world, the largest theater in the Roman Empire, massive tourism and trade, an economic powerhouse, and here, the gospel turns the city on its head. Verse nine of chapter 19 tells us that after being rejected by the synagogue, that Paul reasoned daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now, remember that? We talked about reasoned daily. That means that he answered and fielded questions. You see, a schoolmaster named Tyrannus had a spacious portico where he would teach schoolboys during the normal teaching hours, which was in the cool of the day. But apparently he became a believer. And he allowed Paul to use that space and to begin to, to set up shop and to daily reason and to teach in that large portico with large crowds answering their questions, meeting them in the messiness of life and telling them the good news about hope in Jesus. Now remember that dark magic was uh, pervasive. And as we highlighted last week, God began to move miraculously through Paul, through healings and exorcism, even a handkerchief being able to take from him and to go and to perform exorcisms. And thousands were hearing that the name of Jesus saves. Now, close to three years in, Eph in Ephesus, Paul has a prominent teaching spot, a massive, uh, uh, all these miracles that are taking place, massive impact and revival, right? Life is good. This is every preacher's dream. But I want you 
to know that it came at a great cost. Because as one combs through Paul's other letters to piece together what happened during this two and a half, three years in Ephesus, you get this fuller picture of what happened in Paul's life. Listen to 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia. Now that's Asia Minor, that's Ephesus. That we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Listen to 2 Timothy 1, 16 through 18. The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was... Uh, But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. In uh, in Romans chapter 16, we are told that Priscilla and Aquila saved Paul's life, most likely here in Ephesus. So here's the question What happened? What happened? It's possible that Paul was imprisoned and beaten, and for whatever reason, Luke chose to leave out those details. Ultimately, we don't know the details. Simply, that a man who had endured everything that Paul had up to this point, all right, remember, he had been stoned, he had gone through beatings, he had gone through all of this. He reaches a breaking point here where he says, we despaired of life itself. We had no hope in, our, in ourselves. Our only hope was that God raises us from the dead. You say, Pastor, why are you bringing this up if we do not know the details? We can only speculate. Because I would like to propose that we can know that Paul endured intense spiritual warfare. 50,000 drachmas, a day's wages of sorcery books that were burned. Folks, that's in everyone's home. And the well-known stories are Paul's handkerchief casting out demons, and then when some Jewish exorcists try it, try and do the same, they, they get beat up and are, right? There's that funny story. You see, thousands from all over the world would pilgrimage there to visit the temple of Artemis, and the famed daughter of Zeus, the most worshipped mother goddess for fertility and protection. And catch this, ultimately she was worshipped because of her lordship over supernatural powers. Guys, Ephesus was a stronghold for spiritual darkness. Have you ever been in a place when your spiritual radar just began, the siren is going off? My pastor in college who became a really close mentor once talked about a time that he was over in Africa on a mission trip and he, he unwisely ended up going to a tribal seance. And when he got there, he greatly sensed he should not be there. And that evening... In the middle of the night, he he woke up in a dreamlike state and, and all he would say is he felt like a demon was choking him. Scared him to death, right? He, he wakes up and he spends the entirety of the next day combing through the scriptures, trying to figure out what he has just experienced and what is going on, ultimately to come to this realization that that demonic power had no influence over him. And the next night, as he woke up, again with that same sense and presence, he simply said, Jesus has already paid for me, and you have no influence over me. He rolled over and went back to sleep. 
tell you that story because there are strongholds of spiritual darkness. And Ephesus is one of those places to which Paul will later write back and remind them, Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, Paul is in the middle of revival And yet he is despairing of life itself because he is in a process of learning to put on the armor of God and learning to not be deceived by everything that he sees, but instead to understand that there is a battle that is going on in a different realm. Now let's get back and pick up in the text. We're told that Paul knows his time in Ephesus is coming to an end and that he's going to move on. But that doesn't mean that Satan isn't stirring up one last battle. Listen to verse 23 through 27. About that time, there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. That's what they called Christianity. It was called the way. For a man named Detrimus, a silversmith, who had silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the worksmen of similar trades and said, men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess of Artemis will be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the whole world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. So the month-long Artemis festival had arrived. Every year, pilgrims okay, would travel and participate, come to Ephesus to participate in athletic contests, to get drunk and party, and to have a ritual fling with prostitutes. Achilles Tidius, an eyewitness to one of these festivals, left this description. It was at the festival of Artemis, and every place was full of drunken men, and the whole market was filled with multitudes through the whole of the night. So I'm imagining a month-long Mardi Gras, right? Just like in New Orleans. But all of it is surrounding the temple of Artemis. One commentary writes, there was a special bond between Artemis and the Ephesians. She was called the founder and guide of the city. And her name and image were found on coins and official documents. Moreover, she was regarded as the protector of the city's fortifications and general welfare. In other words, this was her city. And as you see in the picture there, there were silversmiths who would make these small little idols, these trinkets to her. And you can imagine all, all the the people who were coming, they would pick one up and they would take that home and they would have that idol. So now capture this scene because it's magnificent. The gospel has turned the city on its head. In two short years, the atmosphere is completely different when pilgrims arrive and when they walk through the markets. There are massively fewer dark magic booths selling trinkets and books. That used to be the norm. And instead, people are telling of Jesus who has changed them, freed them from the bondage of dark magic. Stories of book burnings and exorcisms are told. Artemis never had power to exorcise demons and to heal. Thousands of personal stories, testimonies 
about how Jesus had saved them from their sin of the past. Wow. And that changed culture sent shockwaves through the economy, right? Because Christians are now investing in the kingdom of God. Storing up treasure in heaven, no no longer investing in enslaving practices of dark magic. Paul was taking up an offering for the, the Christians in Jerusalem who had endured a great famine. You see, suddenly giving generously to brothers in need, it dwarfed everything going on there in Ephesus. Did you know it was reported that during the Second Great Awakening in Rochester, New York, where where 100,000 conversions were reported, that the town's theater and taverns all closed and that crime dropped by two-thirds? You see, a palatable impact because there was revival, because people were getting saved. And what's so amazing about here in Ephesus is that when the tourists showed up, those who had pilgrims from the other regions of, of Rome, and when they showed up, they could tell that the whole atmosphere was different, that there was a new king in town. And it was enough for them to stop buying the silversmith's trinkets. So what happens? Well, like an angry, cornered rat, Demetrius gathers up tradesmen and he begins to charge them. Our prosperity, our livelihood is at stake. Verse 28 says they are filled with rage and they begin to chant, great is Artemis of Ephesus, right? Great is Artemis of Ephesus. They stir up a mob and the mob joins in. And they start to move through the marketplace and grab more people. They capture Gaius and and, uh, Aristarchus because they were close to Paul along the way. They're frustrated because they can't find Paul. And the mob gains momentum as they spill over into the theater of 25,000 people. Most of the people are confused as they're trying to figure out why they're there. Fanciful reasons are shared, but what is clear is that they are angry and there is hostility and we are defending the meaning of what it means to be an Ephesian. They are close to tearing the two Christians to shreds. As word gets back to Paul, he is pleaded, Paul, stay put, do not go. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians, the crowd chants for nearly two hours. Now imagine with me you and I chanting, go Spurs, go for 10 minutes. All right, there's no game, it's just passion. You would get tired very quickly for two hours they chanted. And I ask you again to consider the demonic stronghold of this city. But in God's providence, the highest ranking city official, verse 35, tells us the town clerk. I know that doesn't sound like a high ranking official. That's like the mayor, okay? He comes and he quiets the crowd. He assures them of the grandeur of Artemis. It cannot be questioned. And then he keenly points out, look at verse 37 and 38, for you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. In other words, they haven't done anything. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against against any man, the courts are in session, right? Take it to court, do it lawfully. And in God's providence, the crowd slowly dismisses. Now, after all the commotion, Paul gathers together as many believers as he can, leaders, people whose Uh, had churches meeting in their homes, and he gives them one final exhortation, and then he leaves. Now, we don't have the contents of that exhortation, but if so willing, I would like to give us three exhortations that come out of Paul's letter back to the Ephesians surrounding Ephesians chapter 6. You know, Ephesians chapter six, we went through this a couple years ago, putting on the armor of God. I wanna give us three quick exhortations. 
Number one, beloved, we are in a battle. And we should not be surprised when the enemy attacks. You see, even though they had seen amazing victories of God, healings, exorcism, okay, people were repenting. And the gospel was moving forward at a remarkable pace. But the enemy still attacks. All the more he attacks. Peter will describe Satan as a roaring lion, always on the prowl for his prey. And even though you can comb through here and you can come up with a logical reason, right? It was their pocketbook. It was finances. That's what got them all stirred up. Paul will primarily see this attack and any other as first spiritual warfare. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Beloved, like it or not, we are in a spiritual war. It rages on all around you, and it is for the minds and hearts of you and your spouse and your children and your grandchildren. And Satan is a deceiver, and he is a liar, and he loves confusion. I have never seen our culture more confused. And he hates God. And he hates you. And he hates your children. He is a lion, not a harmless kitten. In fact, Ephesians 6.13 says that the enemy bides his time until the evil day. That is a day when he will come and attack you personally in hand-to-hand combat. In other words, he studies, he understands, he, he, he knows your weaknesses, and then he will come like a thief to steal, kill, and destroy, leaving a wake of anxiousness, confusion, depression, bondage to lust, adultery, divorce, broken lives, broken homes, and a broken nation. I am not trying to monger fear, but I am painting with the brush of scripture. Secondly, our God has broken through with kingly authority. Right, if I only sounded the siren of spiritual warfare and the devastation that the enemy causes, I would lead our hearts, right, troubled at best and paralyzed by fear at worst. I think it's worthy for me to describe to you and build real quickly some of the context of where Paul gets Ephesians chapter 6 in the armor of God. Okay, because in Ephesians chapter six, Paul is actually looking back to the book of Isaiah. And there are two primary passages, Isaiah chapter 11 and Isaiah chapter 59. Let me set up the context of Isaiah 59 so you can understand this. God is looking down from heaven. He sits in heaven and he looks down and he sees the mess that I have just described. The mess and the havoc of sin and the enemy and all that that entails. Because wickedness reigns. There is no justice. Man just does evil to other men. There is no light. There is only darkness. And the picture here, God looks down and he sees men as if blind and they are groping along, looking to find their way. Now, how is that for a picture? It's dramatic that we are spiritually blind and lost and completely helpless. What a devastating picture. 
And God from heaven looks down for someone to help. He looks down for someone to bring hope. He looks down for someone to intercede, but he can find none. And so God said, I will rend the heavens and come down and bring salvation. I will do what cannot be done. Isaiah 59 verse 17, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and he wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. You see, God says, I will do it myself. I will become the warrior and the rescuer, and I will do what no one else can do. I will defeat Satan, and I will accomplish righteousness, and I will judge the wicked and the helpless, and I will take up my own armor, and I will save my people. He says, I will, I will, I will, and then he sends his son. And then Paul picks up on that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. He says, listen, when he raised him from the dead, he seated him at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. You see, he reigns above it all. And as scary as unfolding spiritual warfare and you have an enemy that is greater and stronger and way more smart and more active and studies you and comes for a day of attack, as scary as that is, the truth is, is that he reigns above it all. And he has come down. And so point number three, Paul would say to us, this exhortation is Put on God's armor. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God, right? Not your armor, God's armor, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Verse 13, therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to. And then verse 18, with all prayer and petition, Pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert. And if I were to summarize for you what it means to put on God's armor, I would simply say this. Clothe yourself in the promises of God. That's what it means. Clothe yourself. Believe and apply what God says versus what the world and the enemy says. In fact, we're gonna be offering a class starting in two Wednesdays on exactly this. We call it soul care. But we're walking through how you answer anxiousness and depression and confusion in life with God's word, how you understand his promises and apply it to your life, how you put on the armor of God. So these three things, right? Number one is the realization that we are in a spiritual war. The reality is, is the enemy has rocked most of us to sleep and we do not even see the need for God's armor. We do not even realize what is going on around us. So if you see the need and if you begin to realize the battle is raging on, it is constantly going, it is far above your authority, secondly, understand that Christ reigns, that he has rendered the heavens, that he has come down, that he reigns above it all. And then number three, believe and apply God's promises to you in Christ. Clothe yourself with the armor of God. To close, at a previous church, there was a dear sister came to me at the end of one of the services and just began to, to weep and to confess that the enemy repeatedly attacks her because of past sin. 
that she has done things in her past that she cannot get over, that she cannot let go, and that she carries that burden around and around and around. So I met with her a couple times. And in those meetings, I got permission. I said, now listen, I need to speak harsh to you so that you can understand what is actually taking place on a spiritual level. Here's the reality. You are spitting in the face of Jesus on the cross. Now that's an offensive statement, right? No one wants to spit in Jesus' face. I said, let me explain this to you. If what it takes for you to be forgiven is what Jesus did plus all the groveling and self-punishment and wounding of yourself that you constantly do, if it takes Jesus plus whatever else, then what you are saying is that Jesus has not paid it all. And so we sat down and we combed through some scriptures and I showed her. And one of my favorites is Revelation chapter 12. Because in Revelation chapter 12, it talks about the, the, the enemy who accuses uh, uh, before the heavenly father day and night, who loves to bring accusation against us. And then in that passage, it says, but he has been thrown down, right? Because of the blood of the lamb, he has been completely defeated. It is finished once and for all. But he comes down to the earth and he's angry and he comes to you and he whispers in your ear and he stirs up confusion and strife and he lies to you and he lies to you and he lies to you. And we walk through that scripture passage. And I'm telling you, she was in bondage for years because the enemy constantly came to her and constantly brought up the sins from her past and she could not let them go. I showed her in scripture and the next time it happened, she simply said, Jesus has paid it all. Amen. She came back to me the next time with a giant smile on her face, beaming from ear to ear, and she said, it worked. <laughs> he has nothing to say to that. It is done. It is finished. <clears throat> See, she clothed herself. And not her armor, but the armor that is supplied from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for the way that it teaches us. God, honestly, of, of scary things, of things that are so far above our comprehension and our pay grade. They are so high and lofty and yet it teaches us and it reminds us of the truth and that is that you reign above it all. That you are above every principality, every rule of authority. You are above it all. And you are a king who rendered the heavens to suffer and die in my place. There is no God like you. There is no one who sets the prisoner free like you. Father, if there's anyone here this morning under the sound of my voice that needs that freedom, that is captive to the lies of the enemy. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would move in might and in faith and that you would display the power of the name above every name, Jesus. That in his name, we are set free. It's in his name we pray, amen. Church family, as the prayer team comes and leads us in a final song, you are invited to respond. I can't prescribe to you what that looks like. 
But I can tell you, you are commanded by God's word to be obedient to whatever he has said to you this morning. I just want you to respond with obedience. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If you want to use the steps or the stage as an altar to pour out your expression of gratitude or you want someone to pray with or whatever you need to do to respond in obedience to him, I pray that you would have the freedom this morning to do business with God. Would you stand?